Okay, can I just begin? Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So, Namaskar, everyone. Thank you for uh, staying through and for, for your tenacity and patience. It's not always easy to sit through, uh, especially in an online format. Uh, so, number of you who want to um, switch on your cameras, that's perfectly fine. But if you don't want to do it right now or don't do it, that's that's okay too. But as soon as I finish my presentation, uh, during the question answer session or comments, if you can uh, open up, I mean, uh, unlock yourself and uh, be visible as long as you are comfortable with it, uh, that, that, can be, that can be interesting. So, Namaskar. Uh, I'm going to take around, say, 40, 45 minutes, maybe uh, may go up to 50 uh, and walk you through uh, some interesting things, which I consider interesting. And then the uh, remaining 15, 20 minutes, you have to tell me if you thought those were interesting. In some sense, I want to share with you some of the things that you may already know, because I don't know everyone's background. In other cases, I would tell you something that uh, you have never heard and might fascinate you, might surprise you. And there may be few where it might provoke your thinking in the sense, is this really true? Okay, I mean, is this really uh, something that I never heard or I heard something that's exactly opposite of what uh, I am telling you? And my goal is or my hope is that that takes us into our question answer or interaction session where you ask questions, where you give your comments and I may make some few comments or give answers, okay? Mm -hmm. So with that, I'm going to start sharing my PowerPoint So let's do it here. All right. So that's our subject, Mysteries of Ancient India, Science, Medicine, Mathematics, Astronomy. Now, anytime you hear the word mystery, what comes to your mind? The mystery is something that we don't know what's going in the background. Imagine you going to a show, you know, say whatever place, a magician coming to your birthday party and performing few magical tricks. Now, if you are fascinated by what he or she does, then it's a mystery to you and that's why you are fascinated. But of course, you know that to the magician is not a mystery, okay? <laughs> the magician happens to know everything that's going behind because he or she is the one who is creating it. Now, science is like that. Until we know why certain things work the way they work, it's a mystery to us. But if we know the background mechanism, then it's no longer a mystery. That does not mean we are no longer fascinated by it. We are still fascinated by it. Okay, same thing with the medicine, mathematics. And although I said science, medicine, mathematics, some of the example I'm going to share, they will be a blend of all of these three. They will be a blend of astronomy and to some extent also technology. That how we made use of, we as a humanity, made use of the knowledge to make our life better, to travel from one place to another, to ensure that we have sufficient food, to ensure that we have a good health, so that we can enjoy our life, okay? So it's a mixture of it, but just to give you some idea, I just split that into science, medicine, mathematics, or things like this. And of course, this is going to be in the specific context of India, but India is part of the world and therefore the world context. Just to set you a background for these mysteries, okay? Uh, this could be uh, information that you know well. This could be information that would surprise you based on what you might be studying in your history books, depending on middle school, high school, and the particular uh, textbook syllabus that your teacher might be using. Or it might provoke you saying impossible. What are we talking here? Okay. But this is just a quick one page summary of my research work of last 30 plus years. And this will set the context of a time against which we are going to explore the mysteries of ancient India. So for example, when we hear the word ancient, and you know, the, what do we mean by that? I mean, 1000 year old ago is also ancient, 2000 year ago is ancient, and so is 5000, so is 10,000, so is a 1 million years ago. So what are we exactly talking? 
Just to give you some rough guideline, imagine where we are today, that the world today is 21st century. That's where we are. Now, if I ask you your birth year, okay, depending on like you are what, all middle school, high school. So most of you will end up saying 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, and so on, right? What is that 2004? Well, that's, two, that's like saying 2004 years, 2004. Some baseline is that zero, which is the basis for the Gregorian calendar or a Julian calendar originally. Now it's a Gregorian calendar and it is associated okay just by a reference we don't know the historical fact with uh, possibly jesus okay jesus christ uh, whether there is a historical data we don't know that but that's not the subject today now just as a reference thing because that's the calendar we are familiar with we are going to use that calendar i'm going to take you backwards so minus 5k means minus uh, so that means 5000 bc before common era bce 10 minus 10k means 10,000 BCE before common era, 15k, 15,000 BCE and so on. Uh, generally, you might be also familiar with the terms AD and BC, like Anno Domani, the year of our Lord, meaning uh, not our Lord, but referring to a specific religion, Christianity, or BC in the sense of before Christ. Now, what the many academics in America did, initially initiated by many Jewish academics, is that they said this is very religious terminology that belongs to one religion, we shouldn't use it. And so they started something called CE, meaning common era, and BCE, meaning before common era, but still referring to the same calendar, because we are all right now at least stuck with that calendar. Anyways, so what I did is I started studying Mahabharat. Most of you would have heard the name, where Krishna, Bhagavad Gita, and uh, I extracted all the astronomy descriptions from Mahabharat. And just like you use the some use your knowledge information to solve a crossword puzzle, okay, or a jigsaw puzzle, uh, in a scientific fashion, when I put that together, it leads us the entire evidence of Mahabharata text takes us to 5561 BCE as the year of Mahabharata war, which is going simplified going more than 7500 years ago. I did the same thing to the text of Valmiki Ramayana. I extracted close to 600 plus uh, astronomy descriptions from Ramayana. In case of Mahabharata, close to 300. And the Ramayana, again, solving it like a jigsaw puzzle, crossword puzzle, in a scientific fashion, it takes you to 12,209 BC. And because we are going to talk about the science, uh, medicine, astronomy, mathematics, I'm just setting up a stage. In fact, Briefly, I will show you what are some of the things that I used to actually arrive at this date. And then Rugved, okay, I heard, I know you heard a few talks on the Vedas, you know, different Vedas and whatnot. The Rugveda, one of the oldest texts of humanity, the oldest text of humanity that is available to us, available to everyone in the world. What is the timing of it? Again, this time I did not use astronomy. Remember, science is very broad. This time I used the geology evidence, the hydrology evidence, the river evidence, the change of rivers paths, uh, the, the, what kind of water quantity they had and so on and so forth, match with the descriptions of uh, those rivers in the Rugveda. And what that tells us, it doesn't give us an exact date, but it says our Rugveda or some portions of our Rugveda are definitely older than 24,000 years. So for simplicity, I'm going to give you a mnemonic formula, okay? If you know the multiplication table of seven, this would be, this should be easy. If you want to, as a crude way, you want to remember, Mahabharat happened more than 7,000 years ago. Ramayana happened more than 14,000 years ago. So seven times two, 14. And the old portions of Rugveda are definitely older than 21,000 years. So seven, 14, 21. That's an easy way to remember. Now, this one I did, I took, took me some 30 plus years, but I published my first book on Mahabharat in like 2011. And since then, I have found tremendous scientific evidence from multiple different disciplines of science. And if we get time, at least I will highlight a couple or at least maybe four or five different disciplines. That evidence perfectly supports this timeline that I have developed. Okay. And... Uh, if any one of you find more curious to do it, you can watch, you can go to YouTube. Just type my name, Nilesh Oak, 
okay and you're going to find i don't know the exact number but possibly 100 200 300 400 plus videos okay and they range from like a few minutes like a two to four five minutes all the way to 90 minutes okay that long and you can watch those if you are, are into reading you these books are available on amazon all written by me uh, the Bhishma Nirvana, that is to do with the Mahabharata dating. Historic Rama has to do with the dating of Ramayana. And when did the Mahabharata war happen? Well, the title gives it all, right? When did the Mahabharata war happen? It talks about the dating of Mahabharata. Um, so you can uh, read those if you like, especially if you are into science, you like math, you like astronomy. And those of you who don't like math, that's perfectly fine. But somewhere you have to say, you know what? I don't understand this astronomy. I'm not, I will just trust the author, but at least I want to see what conclusion uh, he drew. To set our stake, is science Western in origin? Now, if it was interactive and your phones were off, I would have asked you that question face to face, but I'm sharing a PowerPoint, so I'll not ask that. Many of us think that the science began in uh, Western Europe, UK and France and Germany and so on, some 500, 600 years ago. Now, some people think we might have some inkling of it around the world, like the Greeks and Romans, but that's usually what you're going to hear in your uh, work syllabus. If some of you, though, again, who are in reading, this is not a very big book, but I'm going to encourage you, if you are interested, you can read it. Uh, you can even download PDF from few sources. Is science Western in origin? Okay, this is written by Professor C.K. Raju. Okay, he's uh, in India. He has done some tremendous work in many different areas. I'll not go there, but this is an easily readable book. Is science Western in origin? And the answer in that book, he says, is no. Okay, now that is not to discount some of the great work that is been done in the last 500 years in the Western world, right? So some of the names that comes to mind, uh, some brilliant work, right? So Copernicus and Tycho Brahe and Kepler and Galileo and Newton and Einstein and Lagrange and Fred Faraday and Maxwell, just long list, okay? Beautiful work. But some of the foundations, not some of the, many of the foundations that came from around the world, such as civilizations of South America, civilizations of Africa, like Egypt, for example, uh, civilizations like our Indian civilization, civilizations of China, and many other places around the world, okay? That was the foundation for what Europeans could do in the last 500 years. Now, again, if it was interactive, I would have asked you this question. You are in from middle school to high school. What is science or what is the logic of scientific method or what is scientific method? Now, I'll just give you the answer. And in the interaction session, you can tell me if I told you the right thing or not, or if you don't, don't agree with me, tell me what is the right method as you see it. Sir Karl Popper, a best known philosopher of science of this last century, the best philosopher, okay? Now, He's, he put it, well, he did not invent it. He put it, which was well known and a very nicely put definition of a science, modern science, you can say, or logic of scientific discovery, logic of scientific method. He says, what is science? You start with a problem, uh, a problem that is not solved by anybody else with, with the existing theorems, existing theories, and you try to solve it. To solve that problem, you propose a theory. OK, now that doesn't mean the theory is right or wrong. We don't know that yet. But you propose a theory and one of the consequence outcome of that theory is the solution to your problem. Then what do you do? Are you done? No. Then you start looking for evidence. Then you take that evidence and find a way to objectively test it. And then you draw the inference. Then you look at additional evidence, see anything conflicts with it. And essentially, you have to come out with a scenario which is more likely versus less likely. The science is not about proving things and disproving things. In fact, science does not like that language. Although, don't be surprised if that is the language you use in your school. In the elementary sense, we do use that for certain years. But once you get deeper, we don't like the language of proving and disproving because science cannot prove things. It cannot disprove things. It can disprove certain theories, Okay, certain claims it can disprove. So what does it do then? It corroborates, it tends to support, it brings the evidence that tends to support, and it can falsify existing theory. So in word of Karl Popper, it says a science is a triangulation of explanation, prediction, and testing, that middle triangle. 
in the context of a theory and in the context of a background knowledge. Okay, now what if I tell you that what that I just described as a very succinct definition of Karl Popper, it is given even in a much sharper way in a smaller words in one of the darshanas. I know you did darshanas yesterday or maybe it could be day before, I forgot, uh, whatever it was the first day. Uh, you did shat darshanas and you talked about sankhya and nyaya if you remember Vaisheshika. This is from uh, the Nyaya Darshana, but you will find some slightly modified definition in each of the other Darshanas also. This is from Nyaya Darshan where it says Pratyaksha Anumana Upamana Shabda Pramanani. It said four things, Pratyaksha Anumana Upama Shabda. Mm -hmm. That is basically nothing but that triangulation plus the background knowledge. The Shabda is like a background knowledge, but it also means the evidence. So all the five things are actually given there. Something else we need. Besides the method, we also need a certain attitude, okay, towards uh, exploring these things, whether history, whether science, whether medicine, it doesn't matter, our own health, our own nutrition, we need a scientific acumen. It's not biased, it's not blind, and it's not extreme, okay? It's willing to change in the light of new evidence. Now, if you hear, do you tell me, I mean, well, again, it's not interactive, but you might have heard this. In science, how do we begin? No claim is intrinsically valid. Just because somebody told you something, you know, for example, somebody would have told you, you, you know what? Actually, it is every, all the planets are roaming around the earth. Earth is at the center. Now you would laugh at this because now you know Copernicus work and Kepler's work and Newton's and Einstein. But if you go back only 600 years ago, the entire Western civilization was factually believing that Earth is at the center, even 400 years ago, okay? So now how do we decide? Now Copernicus came and said, no, 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 that's not true. It is the sun that is at the center. Now there is a conflict. How do we decide? Well, science says no claim is intrinsically valid. Well, Nayadarshana, Thousands of years ago, then how old is Nyaya Darshana? We don't know exactly, but I'll tell you the writer of Nyaya Darshana, also known as Sage Gautam or Gautam, and he, he whether he or a person like similar to his name existed in the Mahabharata times, before Mahabharata times, existed in the Ramayana times, before Ramayana times. So more than 7,000 years ago, more than 14,000 years ago. Now, the Nyaya Darshana, it is referred to in the Ramayana, it is referred to in the Mahabharata. Okay, so whether the actual text, whether we have today was when written, we don't know. We know that this knowledge existed. And the next one, the Pramana Tashartha Pratipatte is basically saying no claim is intrinsically valid. So what do we need to do? Hitchens Razor. How many of you have heard Hitchens Razor? Okay, listen carefully. What Hitchens said, Christopher Hitchens, he was a, uh, he just passed away a few years ago, a British uh, individual, a uh, famous atheist. Now in India, Hinduism, we don't have a problem of a theist versus atheist, okay? But that's another subject. I'll not talk about that in this one. Christopher Hitchens, a very brilliant mind, uh, he said in the context of a science or any claim, he said, now listen carefully, whatever can be claimed without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. So somebody makes a claim and you say, okay, based on what? He says, well, what do you mean? I'm just telling it. You listen to it, right? I mean, how can I be wrong? Then you say, well, no, I don't have to listen to you if you don't have evidence. So whatever can be claimed without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. That's called Hitchens razor, okay? As a statement, as a logical, as a logical understanding. Nyaya Darshana thousands of years ago is saying the same thing. In fact, because of just to manage the time, I'll not go deeper. What the Nyaya Darshana says, Pramana Anupapatya Upapatti Bham. This is in Sanskrit is even more powerful than Hitchens razor, okay? But I'll just skip, and if we have a time in question answer, we might go there. Uh, scientific investigation, another important thing. Remember, if you have heard about the creationism or creationism versus evolution, okay? Or Einstein's theory versus Newton's theory, okay? Is something happens based on a germ or it does something have to do with the nutrition? I mean, these are all there. Remember, all the scientific theory, claims, investigation, comparison is always between two competing theories uh, that claim to solve the same problem. It's never about whether that thing is a right or wrong. 
but many people even so called educated people don't get it in science it is always about a comparison between the two to decide which which theory is a better it may not be perfect in fact there is no theory in science that is perfect none not even einstein's not newtons not kepler's no theory is perfect okay uh, so now that particular principle which is well understood in science again nyaya darshana is talking about this thousands of years ago it says in sanskrit so pratipaksha sthapana hi no vitanda what does it mean he says you want to do a debate about a certain theory debate about a certain solution now you are you are criticizing some person's solution but you do not have your own solution to the same problem you are just doing a wrangling you are wasting everybody's time that's not allowed you should be declared as a defeated and removed from the debate he is saying so pratipaksha sthapana hino vitanda you don't have your own position alternate position you are wasting everybody's time okay you are doing a very foolish act that's what it says okay now i'm going to quickly take you to ramayana times i don't know if you how many of you recognize this creature here now looks like a elephant and well it might be a elephant but if you look carefully you are going to notice something that's not you have not seen in the zoo again if it was interactive i would have asked you the question to tell me i am going to tell you what it is and see if you notice that elephant like creature is shown with a four tusks and not two tusks like our modern day elephants now what what do we have to do with it let's go to more than 14000 years ago to the timing of ramayana when hanuman is in lanka and trying to look for a sita what he notices there is that ram ravana's palace is been guarded okay of course by military men soldiers and what not but also guarded by elephant like creatures elephant like creatures and i will give you the translation here that's easy to see by armed soldiers but also elephants and the it gives a description elephants with two tusks now that's not a surprise you are used to it but also three and four tusks now we have not seen four tusk elephants in our times but the question you may ask well what about ramayana times i mean were they there i mean is there a evidence for their possible existence and remember we in science we are like beggars beggars cannot be choosy we wish to have evidence we may or may not have evidence and if there is no evidence we cannot talk about a certain claim that's what we saw fortunately you see the evidence for similar creatures with four tusk around the world that's what what i'm showing you the map but not in our times okay they are known by different names stockdown and gompotheres and there are many names i'm just picked one but the modern evidence the archaeology evidence the fossil evidence shows us sorry the fossil evidence something is wrong okay the the fossil evidence sorry the date is missing that's fine the fossil evidence shows us that these gompotheres like creatures elephant like creatures with four tusks existed for millions of years ago but they also existed as late as 9000 bc which is to say what 11000 years ago okay and i i told you just now where the ramayana happened it happened 14000 years ago okay so yes there were creatures like that existing in that time so not a surprise if valmiki ramayana describes elephants with two three and four tusks okay let's go further something about the world geography very fascinating okay again imagine yourself thinking you are there in the ramayana times 14000 years ago and if you know the story great if not just a quick summary of that story then hanuma then rama with sugriva sugriva gets all the vanara parties together divides the vanaras are not monkeys they are human beings okay they are just called vanara those who are living in the vana meaning a forest they have a preferred lifestyle just like we have a preferred lifestyle okay we want to live in a suburb we want to live in the main city we want to live in the smaller places we want to be vegetarian vegan what not right it's a preferred lifestyle for them these these vanaras have come together and sugriva sends them in the four different directions now in reality they don't go that far but sugriva gives a descriptions in each directions and lo and behold 
the descriptions that are there in the Valmiki Ramayana, where Sugriva describes each direction, essentially he's describing east direction from India all the way to Andes, that is South America. In the south, he's describing India to Antarctica. In the north, he's describing all the way to the Arctic Sea. And in the west, he's describing all the way to the Alps. If there is any area that it appears he has no good knowledge of, that is the Atlantic Ocean and area surrounding it. Okay, that what he doesn't seem to have a knowledge. In the west direction, he does possibly know up to Spain. Now, this may some surprise you, this may shock you, but let me tell you something else. If you read the, some great science books, only 100 years old, like say 1893, okay, uh, Sir Oliver, I have that book with me. And it shows the earth, 1893, guys, I'm talking. It does not show on the globe there, Antarctica anywhere. It does not. Now, there were some European expeditions to Antarctica, and they had reached there, but they did not know if there was a landmass or they were simply just looking at the uh, iceberg. Okay, so not everyone was convinced that Antarctica was a land. Guess what? 14,000 years ago, Sugriva is describing that as a land, but he's also talking of possibly some people living there, not very good condition. He says, he tells Wanaras, don't go there. It's very treacherous to go there and very difficult to come back. It's all dark place and so on. He says the same thing about the Arctic. Uh, but I, because of a time, I will not go there again. When he talks of Arctic, he talks about the Northern Lights or Aurora Borealis. Okay, He's saying that's what you will see. Although the place is dark, even it's shining through the night. That Those are the descriptions from Valmiki Ramayana. So great knowledge of a geography. Now, next question immediately you should ask is, how did they go to these places, right? Such a far distances. I mean, Pushpak Viman you would have heard, but everyone was not traveling by Pushpak Viman. Okay, and where is the evidence of Pushpak Viman? We will not go there unless we go into the discussion. But something else I want to tell you, because I mentioned India to Andes, okay? What did they find there? How do we know that uh, Sugriva knew Andes? Okay, there are many pieces of evidence. I'm just showing you one here, again, to keep within the time. This is a structure. Some of you may know it if you have gone uh, traveling to South America. This is in Peru, just on the west coast. I mean, the coastline there near Paracas, okay, Bay, Bay of Pisco. This one is engraved into the that phosphate rock or whatever the colorful rock it is. It's known as the candelabra of the Andes. And in terms of dimensions, it's not a small structure. It's 600 to 800 feet tall, two to three feet deep. That's how it is dug and it's created into that stone and can be seen from 12 miles in the sea. When Spaniards went to South America and the local natives, when they ask, hey, who, who built this? When did you build this? They say, oh, we don't know. He says, oh, do you know why it was built? No, we don't know. Do, you, do your forefathers built it? Said, no. Even they told us that this structure was always there. So the locals there knew the structure, Spaniards found it, but nobody knew why this structure existed, when it was, when it was created, what was the purpose? Guess what? Now I'm just giving you one astray reference, but I have, I have given the talks, you can check those on the YouTube called Sugriva's Atlas, okay? And you will see this a detail going from all the way India to South America. But just this one, now guess what? Valmiki Ramayan, gives a beautiful description. I'll give you a crude translation for those who cannot read the Nagri script, okay? Trishira Kanchanas Ketus Talas Tasya Mahatmana Stapita Parvatasya Agre Virajati Savedika. A three-headed, like a trident, like a Shiva's uh, Trishul, okay? A three-headed golden flag shining on top of the mountain with the base at the bottom. It says Savedika. If you have seen a Homa, you know, in the mandir, in the temple, like, you know, there's a rectangular frame that they put the fire and then do swaha and so on. That so Vedikaha, Vedi, Veda Bhumi, like for the Yadnya, is also you can see here, just like a structure, like a rectangle at the bottom. Okay. But Valmiki Ramayana doesn't even stop there. Again, remember, we are talking 14,000 years ago. It also tells you why this structure was created. Okay. Uh, it says Purvasya Dishi Nirmanam Krutam Tatri Dasheshwari Tatah Param Hemamaya Sriman Udaya Parvata. This structure was created by Indra. I hopefully you have heard that name or you just in general know. Okay, that's a very famous deity in the in the Rugveda. Um, and 
it was created by Indra. Now, you may not know all of this detail, but Indra is considered the designated deity for the east direction. Now, remember, Sugriva is giving the description of the east direction. Earth is round, so somewhere you have to stop. And he calls the Andes as the Udaya Parvata, the eastern mountain. That's where the east direction stops. Just like our international day line that goes through the Pacific, right? The same thing. It's the same concept but 14,000 years ago. He says it was created by Indra to mark the eastern direction, okay? And beyond that, if you go, you will find the mountain covered with the snow. Hemamaya Sriman Udaya Parvata, that is the Andes mountain. Now you must be asking, okay, well, how were these guys going? Okay, well, I mean, boats, I mean, everyone cannot be going through the uh, plane, but we don't have a evidence of a plane, uh, of any, any physical evidence of uh, Pushpak other than the descriptions in Valmiki Ramayana. Now, bring your, put your scientific hat. That's why we don't have to say, therefore, Pushpak Viman doesn't, didn't exist. That will be very illogical. But we cannot say that Pushpak Viman existed in this fashion. This is how the design was. This was the fuel. No, because we have no information. So it has to just stay there, sit there as a description mm -hmm. in our Valmiki Ramayana until we are lucky to find some evidence. But let me show you what evidence is available for navigation going by the oceans. What I'm showing you is the geological map of a port structure near Pumpuhar in the southern part of India in Tamil Nadu state, okay, the east coast, the place Pumpuhar. And Pumpuhar, the modern day Pumpuhar is right here. But when the scientists, researchers, oceanography researchers did the research, do you know what they found? Deep inside the ocean, there are layers of ports, okay, inside. Now they are underwater. But if you go back, for example, again, my date is gone. So 20,000 years ago, this port one, P1, this port is as sophisticated as the ports existed around the world 500 years ago. Listen carefully. A port that existed 20,000 years ago on the east coast of India near Tamil Nadu, is as sophisticated structure-wise, the whole logistics-wise, the way the ports existed, sophisticated ports existed only 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. Now what happened? When the ocean came, that port was gone. Then they rebuilt the port, the P2. Then again, ocean water level is rising. Then they built P1, and the story goes on. My point is, a sophisticated navigation existed in India going back to 20,000 years. And Ramayana, I'm talking only 14,000 years ago. This is not to say only 20,000. We have a evidence of going back only up to 20,000 years ago. We just don't know how far back it existed. Okay. So now they had sophisticated navigation. They had a sophisticated knowledge of geography. Okay. What else they had and how they built it. So is medicine Western in origin? Okay, what are you, what is your answer? Well, in the modern times, yes. I mean, a lot of stuff is happening uh, in this. Like we see the sophisticated hospitals, sophisticated instruments, just so that you know, I worked for a general electric company and I sold the MRI machines and the CAT scanner machines and various other equipment. I sold power plants, I sold aircraft engines. Okay, so yeah, a lot of technology. But just take vaccination. I mean, we know all of us are sitting home, wearing our masks and all of this with this Corona thing. Okay, what do you know about vaccination? Again, if it was interactive, if I, if I would have asked you, I know you would have said Edward Jenner. Sometimes people give a wrong answer. Pasture, you know, Louis Pasture. Yeah, related to germ theory, but as far as the vaccination goes, what you would have studied, what you would have heard is Edward Jenner, right? And the UK folks, you know, they are also very proud to tell, hey, you know, we invented this, we discovered this and gave it to the whole world. I'm going to tell you a true story today. That's not the whole story. There is a element of truth in what that is, a story is told, but not the whole truth. In fact, only 10% of the truth. Okay, so what do we, what is a typical story that you might have studied or if you go to Wikipedia, you're going to study. Wikipedia, again, is okay for a typical information. But please remember, especially I'll tell you just limited subject of Indian civilization, Wikipedia is a disaster. It's a disaster. Invariably, it will give you a wrong information, but it is given in such a polished manner, you will not even realize that they're telling you, they're giving you a fake stuff, okay? So please, uh, I will encourage you, those of you who are curious, to go back and check on Wikipedia what it says. 
Well, this is what we know. Edward Jenner was born in 1739. He became a doctor in 1792. Then he started working on experiments around 1996. And very soon, then he came up with the vaccination. Why vaccination? Because cow, okay, was in, in Spanish, baca or waca. Uh, Latin waka. That's why the vaccination. I will uh, tell you, I don't know if you knew that, but the Sanskrit old Rigvedic word for a cow is also a wak. Okay. We are going back more than 21,000 years ago when none of these even languages existed. Okay. Then finally, the vaccination came out. Okay. And we should give a credit to Edward Jenner for doing this. I mean, he was criticized like you won't imagine in the Europe. Everyone was laughing at him when he was doing this. Okay, but what was his confidence? His confidence, it goes back to India. How many of you knew that? Okay, and also China, but the Chinese method did not work in the Middle East and did not work in Europe. Uh, it, again, so this is a talk by itself. I have given 10 series talks, 10 series documentary on this. So I'm not going to go in details, but there is a documentary evidence accepted by the Europeans. In fact, we know that because Europeans wrote it, at least going back to 14th century in India about this inoculation. And I'm going to show you the evidence exists even in the Mahabharata that is going back 7,500 years ago. It's called Sheeta Putana, okay? Uh, so a documented evidence for the inoculation, they call it in variolation, slightly different than what Edward Jenner did finally in India going back to 14th century and before. Instead of giving it to uh, like a cow, meaning developing through other ways, they directly use the cow smallpox vaccination itself to cure the patients, okay? And they were doing it. And now look, contrast this with what Europe was thinking because Europe was also getting smallpox. You may not know the story of European deliberately bringing smallpox with the blankets and giving it to the Native Americans. You might have studied that in a history. Europeans were thinking of a smallpox only as a skin problem, like some inflammation of the skin, and therefore their treatment was wrong and people were dying, okay? While at that time, European people in India, in the West, West Bengal area or the Bengal area, have written papers in Royal Society admitted that the efficiency and efficacy of the Indian method was so powerful, it was better than Six Sigma, maybe one in a million person might die, okay? Those who have gone through this treatment. Uh, in 1731, Robert Colt wrote a long paper from India, okay? Describing the Indian method of inoculation, okay? Then 1767, Dr. Holwell, he also wrote another paper on the inoculation against the smallpox, the Indian method. They were trying to convince the Europeans to adopt it. Europeans were not willing to adopt it. They were into their dogma, you know. They were thinking it's just a skin condition and very much of a dogmatic society at that time. Very sad thing that they took this knowledge from India. These two people did a great thing. But finally, when Edward Jenner described the inoculation, guess what? This is the method applied by colonialists for a long time. Once they snatched the knowledge, stole the knowledge from different areas of the world, and they finally understood it themselves, they modified it, guess what? They took away the roots of the origin. They didn't want to give credit to those people. To the extent, in fact, in 1802, the Indian method of inoculation was banned by the East India Company, which is a British company that was controlling parts of India. They banned it. They did not want the Indian method to be used because now with their method, they can sell it. Okay. I mean, that's, that's the politics of medicine. And guess what? It's only then, no, these are all documented proof, but the denial of Indian origin of inoculation continues down to our times. I have seen papers in a peer reviewed journals in 81 and as late as 2012, still not giving the due credit to Indian origination of this. So that's the Indian medicine system coming to the rest of the world. Quickly, rhinoplasty. Uh, do you know what that means? Like somebody, you know, like a, what you call plastic surgery. What's the origin of it? If you just go at a very functional level like Wikipedia, it will talk about things like this. And these guys should be given a credit, no doubt about it. Okay, so here Carpew, you know, wrote a book in 1816 about the rhinoplasty. Please note down this patch on the person's head, okay? Uh, how successfully restoring the nose that is gone, okay? Like artificial nose and then taking a skin flap and putting it on the top and making it like a real nose. 
and then somebody translated into German, and that's where this term rhinoplastic was coined. That's what we use today. That was written in 1818. Ah, it was done in Europe. Well, let's see how it came to Europe. That's why I note down that patch, basically. Okay. See, he's writing plastic churgery. Do you know where that even the churgery became surgery now came from? It is from a cut, kritika. You know, cut. The C can be K or C because of how they spelled. They didn't have any proper rules. It comes from the cut surgery, okay, from, from India. And I'm going to show you that. In fact, it started in 1794. Uh, the two British officers saw a nose operation, rhinoplasty, the name didn't exist in that way, performed on the streets of Pune in India in 1794. They wrote about it in, in uh, Europe. It made a big revolution and everyone started studying this method. They sent their senders, you know, messengers saying, please find out, is this really true or somebody made up a story? Okay. A lot of work happened and the, the diagrams that you are seeing here are actually, look how the man looks. Okay. There is a name. His name was Kosaji. Okay. In Pune. His nose was gone in one of the war fighting and it was replaced by a potter on the streets of Pune. You know, the surgery was not restricted to some sophisticated, uh, you know, journal. I mean, somebody who has got the graduation certificate in a master of surgery or something. Actually, everyone was capable like a barber. That was the same case in Europe. They were doing it. They got this from India. They made detailed drawings. Then Sir Hamilton found another manuscript because, you know, they thought, okay, only people figured out on their own and maybe there is no methodical uh, scientific way of doing it. Well, they were wrong. This Sir Hamilton found a document. This was, look, you cannot read it. Even it's not Nagri. It is in a Gupta Brahmi script. This is a 2000 year old documents, 2500 year old documents. Sir Hamilton found it in 1890, somewhere in the China Russia border. Okay, just imagine that. But it is actually in Sanskrit. Okay, and it describes all these great uh, medicine men of India Atreya, Harita, Parashara, Bhela, Garga, Sambhavya, Sushruta. Okay, and then if you go to Sushruta Samvita, which is one of the oldest texts on medicine in India, I'm not going to read this. Okay, but this is describing exactly how to do the nose job, the rhinoplasty. Okay. Now, you know, don't think that only we sing this as a stotra or a mantra in the praise of a God. Many times even the praise of a God has a meaning beyond just the praise, but sometimes it is not understood. This one is describing how to do the nose plastic surgery, what medicine, medication to use, how to take care, how long does it take for it to heal and so on and so forth. So beautiful. Now, this is in what, 1890, but even a hundred years after, okay, you will still see British trying to deny the credit of rhinoplasty. Some of the highlighted words, you know, how, what, did they, what did they say? Even when they took our technology, they said to criticize the subject matter of this work in detail would be labor wasted. <laughs> its interest is rather antiquarian than scientific. So they are taking it, the knowledge, scientific knowledge in one hand, but refuse to acknowledge it as a scientific on the other hand and that gets into our history books and then we say oh there was no science anywhere else except the europe or uh, greece and italy and so on or rome but then he says but a collection of complex faragos meaning the combinations the formulations prescribed according to a fanciful and erroneous pathology is practically useless see the language now these are the same folks okay glaxo if you have heard the company name glaxo welcome the CEO of a Glaxo Welcome, this is in last century, last hundred years. He sent his expert person to India in last hundred years, actually last 50 years, okay, 80s or 70s, with a task to go to India, okay, scour every single Ayurveda Indian medicine text he can find and translate those and note down the formulations. This is 50 years ago. Number of you may know the brand called as Aveda, a -A -V -E -D -A, Aveda, right? Do you know what it stands for? Surprise, surprise. Now it has been bought by somebody else, the company out of Minneapolis, big company. You will see the stores in malls and whatnot online uh, through Amazon. It stands for Ayurveda. The, the founder here got two 
um, Ayurveda specialist from India. This is not long time ago. I'm talking of 30, 40, 50 years ago, less than that. Um, who were Ayurveda experts, brought them to Minneapolis. They made the many of the basic formulations for Ayurveda, the Aveda products. And that's how it is. Now they're improvising it. Okay. So, but why he didn't put it Ayurveda, he put it Aveda. So now most of the people just don't know why it is called Aveda, just another brand name, right? Okay, let's go fast. Um, yeah, so Carpio sent people, so there were sincere peoples there, right? So they sent and saying, is this really true? And you know, there were locals in India, their officers in India, and they admitted, you know, what are some of the things? They said, I did myself the honor to write to uh, Sir Charles Mallet, who had resided many years in India, who obl obligingly confirmed to me the report that this has been the common operation in India from time immemorial this uh, rhinoplasty. Or Mr. Lucas, another English surgeon, was in several instances successful in the operation, which he copied from the Hindu practitioners. Don't be ever feel uh, awkward, inferior guilt to say Hindu. These people are saying it in a glorious terms about the Hindu methods, Hindu science, Hindu technology. Why you should be feel any shame of any kind. Sometimes your parents may feel that and a grandparents, okay? Now make, make that change. Okay. All right. So lots of instruments. No, there are 300 plus instruments described in Sushruta Samvita, but let me walk fast through it. What I have shown using the kind of research I do, and I'll encourage you to read my, watch my videos and whatnot, or read books. I have shown that the Sushruta, the surgeon, the Sushruta, we don't know his exact timing, but based on the evidence that we have, not just one evidence, Tremendous, huge evidence, triangulation of evidence from different sources, from Sushrut Samhita, from Garuda Puran, Mahabharata, the dating of Mahabharata, it goes to definitely more than 6000 BC, which means what? More than 8000 years ago. The, all that I shared with you, some of the things, it goes back to that time, okay? Uh, and of course, they were updating, so some new instruments might have been added to what we have as a current uh, Samhita and so on. How many of you know? Uh, that uh, dental surgery was performed in, uh, well, let me put it the other way. W where do you think the location and the timing of dental surgery? Okay, the oldest dental surgery for which we have a evidence. That's not to say that it might not have been performed before. But the timing I gave you just now, 5000 BC to 7000 BC. And the location of that was India. Okay, now this information, if you go to Wikipedia, try, type dental surgery, you know, and how you will find it. Do you know why? This is a this is a bias word. Be aware of that. That doesn't mean we have to always worry and just walk around thinking everybody's bias against me. No, there are all there are great people everywhere. But the bias is so much that this paper finally made it to Wikipedia because it is written by someone who is non-Indian and it's written, is published in America or Europe. Okay. That person with evidence has admitted that the oldest evidence of dental surgery comes from India, Indus Valley Civilization, and it goes back to the timing of it to 5000 BC to 7000 BC. Okay, that's like a 7000 to 9000 years ago. Now, what happens is, uh, like here I showed you this temple is the Krishna temple in Dwarka. But this is a modern temple, by the way, not from 7000 BC. But remember, Mahabharata timing is a 7500 years ago. That is when Krishna's Dwarka was flooded. Okay. So we only have a description of Krishna's Dwarka. Now we created a new Dwarka in, in remembering our Krishna. Okay. So now what happens is many artists draw the paintings of Dwarka, imagining based on the descriptions of Dwarka, which are there in the Mahabharata and other texts. But we don't have any physical evidence, some physical evidence that takes us to 7,500, 30,000, but not the whole description of it, you know, because it's gone underwater, like Atlantis story. But these are some of the paintings, you know, the imagination of Dwarka, or like this, you might have seen those. Quickly, the last section, and we'll stop. Now, astronomy, mathematics, I'm combining together, because think of it, the Indians did not do anything just for the heck of it. Okay, they did it because it was going to be useful. They were extremely practical, extremely pragmatic people. Okay, now I'm saying they were as if in the past tense, as if we are not. No, I don't mean that. But last 300 years of colonial education and many, their faults, but many of our own faults that we chose not to do the hard work that we needed to do. We are in a situation, we meaning sometimes your parents, you know, you are like a, 
you know, like second generation kids here. Uh, they did not put the efforts that they needed to put to understand their own civilization. So that's why they're sending you to the summer camp. No, I'm just joking. Okay. So they are doing the best that they can. Some of the luxurious thing that luxurious thing that you have, they did not have. Like me, I came from India when I was a 20 year old to do my master's. Okay. With 750 borrowed dollars in my pocket. And of course, a fellowship from here, but nothing else, you know. So our focus sometimes could be different, but you have this luxury, don't waste it, okay? Every single resource you can imagine is there in America. That's the beauty of America, the infrastructure. But if you don't use it, you, you can just dumb down your brain very fast. Astronomy and mathematics are very closely tied together because to do a sophisticated astronomy, mathematics is required. Now, why do you need astronomy? Aha, you need astronomy to live a good life and you say well not really i can have my smartphone and i have a good life well <laughs> the smartphone there is a lot of astronomy behind it that people don't realize okay for agriculture that means we have a sustainable food sources now also but even before people needed a good knowledge of astronomy to understand when the um, uh, when the monsoon would begin, the rainy season would begin, when you should sow the seeds, when you should remove the weeds, when you should cut the crops, and so on and so forth, predicting weather patterns, and so on and so forth. And remember, ports going 20,000 years old, for the navigation, you also need a good astronomy. Just, uh, I don't know if you have seen the Viking series or something. Without the knowledge of astronomy, it is impossible to travel. It, the, the Europeans could not explore the world truly until 500 years ago. Do you think why? First thing, they did not have sophisticated boats. By the way, until the Second World War II or First World War, the place for the most sophisticated boats, building technology, uh, the skill, skill set, labor, who knows how to build it around the world, the best place was India. You don't have to take my word, remember? Trust, but verify. You can go to Wikipedia and do the navigation technology and its origin and where the technology existed and so, so on and so forth. You'll be surprised. Okay, even I did not know that like 10 years ago. And my American friend, American engineer working with me, he said, oh, wow, I didn't know that. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the most sophisticated uh, in the shipbuilding technology existed in India until 100 years ago. Okay, I didn't know that. Okay, but so you need shipbuilding technology, but you also need a knowledge of astronomy. What the picture I'm showing you, I'll not go into the details. These are the references, some screw the references I'm pulling from Valmiki Ramayana. There are six references I pulled here, okay? I will not even read them. It is telling you which, pole st which star was a pole star in the Northern Hemisphere, which star was a pole star in the Southern Hemisphere, and what were the situation at the cardinal points in astronomy, which is to say summer solstice, winter solstice, spring equinox, fall equinox. And if you take those verses, try to understand where this fits like a jigsaw puzzle, it takes you to 13 millennium BC, 14,000 years ago, okay, for the Ramayana. The, my point is the astronomy, Indian astronomy was so sophisticated, okay, that when they just simple gave a descriptions in our epics, in our itihas, like Ramayana and Mahabharata, guess what? The evidence is such, so rich that it can take you and it allows you to find exactly when Ramayana happened, exactly when Mahabharata happened. Now, something interesting, what I just showed you here, the 13 millennium BC, now I'm just switching gear to go to another astronomy text. I don't know if you have heard this from other lecturers or otherwise, you can go and check online. Okay, Wikipedia, not everything is correct, but some information, good information you'll get. There is a text called Surya Siddhanta. It's an astronomy text. Now from that, this is like took us eight years to do this, myself and my another co-researcher, uh, Mrs. Rupa Bhatti. And if the timing works, she will actually come to your group and talk about the uh, ancient Indian architecture. She's an architect by profession, but also a phenomenal astronomer, okay? We work together, and again, without going into the details, we found three specific references from one chapter of Surya Siddhanta. And scientifically, if we have to find out all three coming together, or each of one, one of them coming together, not even all three, but the beauty is that all three also match to this one particular time. Guess what? It is the timing of 12,000 BC. So Surya Siddhanta has something, and Surya Siddhanta is much older than that, but has references that are 14,000 year old, just like a Ramayana. 
And the situation that Surya describes for the pole stars, the Vega in the north and the Canopus in the south, is exactly what is described in the Ramayana, a totally different text. Okay, so now you start getting the quadrangulation, triangulation, biangulation, you know, evidence, same evidence supporting this from multiple pieces of evidence. Uh, just quickly show you, if you want to propose a theory, remember the five things that I showed you, theory, evidence, objective testing, logical inference. That's how you have to do it. If anybody's making a claim, you have to ask what are these five things? These things are given in our modern science. These things are given in our Nyaya Darshana. I showed you something, but there is something more called Avayava. Because of time, I'm not going to go there. You must explain the statement of a theory. You should, uh, that theory describes decides what evidence you will look at. That's what Einstein also said. It is the theory that describes what we can observe, okay? Then you objectively test it, okay? Meaning whatever I see is what you should be able to see, just like your chemistry experiments, you know, the titration and whatnot. Logic or looking through the binocular and looking at the star and noting down the color. Then you logically bring the conclusions and you also explain what background knowledge you assume you used in that. So based on that, I had done this Ramayana dating. Quickly, last one. Mahabharata dating, th there are 300 plus references, but this one particular reference is, uh, it's like simply saying in the panhandle of the big bear, big dipper that you would have seen, the Ursa major, big bear, big dipper. That two stars, you know, this one star called Vasishta, another is called Arundhati in Indian astronomy, modern astronomy, Alcor and Mizar. You know what, right now, if you look at it in our times at the night sky, you will see that the Vasishta or a Mizar is walking ahead of Arundhati because it's not walking, Earth is rotating. So when we look at the north direction, because Earth is rotating like this, we see, okay, Vasishta comes and Arundhati behind and they make a circle around the North Pole star. That is in our times. If you go back 1000, 2000, 3000, 4000, 5000, 6000 years, it's the same scenario. Vasishta ahead, Arundhati behind. Now, why is this a big deal? The verse that I showed you from Mahabharata just, just before here. This is saying at the time of Mahabharata war, it was the other way around. It was the Arundhati who was walking ahead, Vasishta behind. And you know what? Again, the world looked at this statement, a statement like this, and they said, look at these Hindus, look at these Indians. They write something that is impossible in the sense of astronomy. This is impossible in astronomy. That's what they were saying. You know how long they were saying this? Until 2009. Now, I came across this verse in 1995 when I was doing my master's in Canada in chemical engineering. And uh, I thought this is fascinating. Why would Vyasa say something which is not possible astronomically? I continued to research on this. It took me 15 years. I thought actually one weekend and I may solve it. <laughs> I was full of myself, you can say. I was very naive about astronomy. It took me 15 years from 1995 to 2009. But one day in 2009, I was always working, but I finally solved the mystery. It was no longer mysterious, you know, because I knew exactly what was happening. What was happening? This is how we see it in our times and for the last 6,000 years. And if you find these two years, 11,000 years ago, 11,000 BC and 4,500 BC, the Arundhati Vasishta, they were walking together, no one ahead, no one behind. Okay? Gender equality, you can say. But if you look at the situation between these two years, 11,000 BC and 4,500 BC, guess what? Arundhati was walking ahead of Vasishta for that 5,000 year period. And then I use rest of the astronomy evidence from Mahabharata to arrive at a specific year for the Mahabharata war, 55, 61 BC, that is more than uh, 7,000 years ago, 7,500 years ago. So that's how we use evidence like this to actually come uh, solve this jigsaw puzzle. Now, this is just one evidence. Now you have to go and look at additional 300 and see that it matches and it solves that same puzzle and it doesn't arrive at a different date, okay? Quickly, who borrowed from who? People think, okay, you might have read this. Go to Wikipedia, you will see this, that Indian astronomy came from Greek uh, or Romans or something like this. There is absolutely no truth in it. Having said that, if that's what your textbook says, during the exam, do write that answer so that you get it right, okay? In fact, just imagine this. Uh, this is uh, Greeks, okay, R writing, doing the map of the world, okay, this one here. Now, do you know something? The Black Sea that they show did not even exist at the time of Mahabharata war. 
And Mahabharata has extremely sophisticated astronomy. Ramayana has sophisticated astronomy. Surya Siddhanta has sophisticated astronomy. And that goes back thousands and thousands of years. Okay. I'll just skip through this. That Indians knew thousands of years ago that the earth is round. Okay. This is what from Surya Siddhanta. Uh, quickly, do you know uh, how many nautical miles are there around the equator? Nautical miles because they were going by the oceans, right? That number is 21,600. Do you know where that number came from? It came from Indian astronomy, okay? Because uh, when you look at it, Indian astronomy described it, it divided the whole circumference of the earth into 21,600 parts because one arc minute is the resolution of your naked eye and the captain of the ship going there should able to, of course, they might use binoculars, but just looking with a naked eye should able to point out where they are in the ocean. Okay, and because of time, I'm going to stop here. But that number is because of Indian astronomy, the 21,600. It also shows that the measurement was made on the equator. And only astronomy in the whole world, ancient astronomy, which talks of making the measurements from the equator for precise and accurate measurements is Indian astronomy. Okay, um, all right, let me see. This is on the ship. Okay, on the ocean. Once he makes a measurement, he doesn't have to make additional complex calculations. He can go to his chart and he is going to find out right where he is physically because of the specific number they use for the radius. It's a very arbitrary number in some sense, but it's not arbitrary. It has to do with the, the resolution of the eye, okay, and the circumference of the earth. And based on the latitude, they made a corrections for that 21,600 because it won't be 21,600 if you go away from the equator. It was that sophisticated. I'll skip through this. Um, how old is Indian astronomy? Just quickly, the numbers. This is all research done. It is already into books. It's already, already into peer-reviewed papers. Going back to at least 17,000 years ago, our research shows the Surya Siddhanta goes as far back as 40,000 years ago. Okay, big deal about the pi, the last one. Sorry, I took time. People say, what is the formula for pi? The perfect value for a pi cannot, couldn't be found until a certain series, a mathematical series came to America or came to Europe from Kerala, the state of Kerala, okay? Uh, which is a Kerala mathematics they call. It's the Indian mathematics. The uh, Europeans tapped into Kerala, so they call it Kerala mathematics, okay? Uh, this is from Aryabhatiya. He gives a approximate value of a pi. Uh, why approximate? Because remember, he's not just interested in impressing people saying the actual value of pi is a 3.14162384. No, no, no. He wants to use this for practical purposes of agriculture, navigation, doing calculations, and so on. So he has to stop somewhere. Okay. And he says there that he says this is not an exact number, this is approximate. Asanno, here you know, asanno, that means approximate. Okay. You will find uh, so if you go to Surya Siddhanta, another formula that gives you pi. So no big deal about the pi, okay? And I'm, I'm going to stop on this slide. Again, if you're interested, uh, you can uh, listen uh, to my videos or uh, read my books. So after that monologue of mine, if we have some time, uh, Kavita ji, let's see if there are any questions, comments. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Nilesh ji. It was excellent and outstanding. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I personally found it very, interesting and i believe most of our participants uh, agree with me so the uh, the session is open for question answers or anything they want to add to ask to or question thank you again please uh, nilesh ji i do have a question for you um you know this was a one of the most fascinating things i've ever heard this is a very, very great research, uh, but I'm just wondering what made you interested in doing this research? Cause you know, you seem like you had a very successful, you have a very successful career. You, you could have not done this research. You could have been playing cricket or doing golf on the weekend, but you decided to go into Vedic research and find all of this mystery. Why did yeah. you do it? Okay. Well, I do play golf and cricket too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, yeah. um, uh, yes, I was, uh, see, it's a, I have another slide that, but, but great question, by the way, Avi, absolutely great question. I mean, that's a foundational question. 
and I show one slide uh, which where I talk about the basic ingredients that we need and Krishna talks about them in Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. Okay, he talks in a positive and negative both languages. He says, Adnyascha Ashraddha Dhanascha Saushayatma Vinashyati. So to do this, we need a Shraddha, like a reverence, conviction, you know, that this is, this is something exciting is here and let me find out. Then we need Jidnyasa, which means curiosity. Okay, and then this is beautiful. We also need samshaya, which means doubt, a very creative doubt. We cannot blindly accept anything. Then only the question comes of doing something. So to answer your question, it was my curiosity, just my curiosity, like me growing up in India. Uh, and sometimes you guys will struggle it and you will struggle more than even I would, you know, because I was at least had an Indian background there, everyone in India. But uh, when I was growing up, these are the extremes I heard. Like when I'm talking about the Indian civilization, Indian text and so on, the kind of answers I got were extremely binary. Like I'm talking when I'm like a 10 year old, the one answer is like, man, everything is there in our text. You know, there is nothing else as if needs to be done. And that is wrong. I know that that is very wrong. There's just so much in our text, but you can never say that the progress is done. No, neither a material progress, nor even a spiritual progress. Even in spiritual, we have to do experiments to learn more. Okay, so that's one extreme I heard. The second extreme, which is kind of a postmodernist type of thing. We didn't hear the word use postmodern then, but uh, sort of a very uh, anti-civilizational narrative, which is to say there is nothing in these books. These are only, you might have heard the term, Avi, the cow, if it talks about Hinduism, it's a cow, caste and curry. You know, there is as if nothing more. Mm -hmm. So they said, no, it's all about like, you know, some rituals and this and that. And I said, no, the truth has to be somewhere in between. Let me find out my curiosity that led me to this. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Amazing, amazing. Any other questions? I mean, I can go quickly through this uh, list here, or uh, I don't know how much time we have. We might be at the end of our timing here. Uh, let me see, Kavita ji, if I can take a few minutes and see if I can quickly answer those questions. Do we have a time? Yes, yes, please, please. Okay. Uh, so let me see here in the chat session I'm looking at. Uh, this is extremely knowledgeable session. We can be so much proud of Hinduism. Thank you. Uh, deeply Indian such a word study it makes me feel more proud Viva Vare. thank you very much Viva Kare. okay uh, this has been happening since so long they never teach colonization in their countries yeah now it is changing slowly but you are right even the textbooks are still don't talk of it and you know again we need to be very uh, objective and fair okay so for example we should not confuse that somebody did something to us and uh, that person's grandson is now responsible for it you know we have to be very careful about that okay and any civilizations what happens is there are three sanskrit words sanskruti prakruti and vikruti okay sanskruti is like going beyond you know what is basically expected from a ordinary decent behavior the prakruti is a mainstream decent behavior but vikruti is like a distortion of certain concepts. And yeah, it happens. I mean, I've, India never had a caste system, but even the Varna Jati system that we have, some bad elements did enter the system. We cannot just deny them, right? So I'm saying we have to be very objective and try to fix those errors. They happen all the time, Cross, course correction. A pilot's flying a, a flight, you know, when he sees because of the storm or something, it has gone some path, it, he or she makes a small correction so that you reach your destination, San Francisco or Chicago or wherever that may be. Okay, let's see, this has been happening, okay, uh, for rich culture, India is blessed to have, I'm just looking if there is a question. Uh, okay, uh, rich history, made the world know all about this gentleman, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kavita ji for, okay, is there any, yeah, th thanks to Kavita ji for finding me, I agree. <laughs> okay, is there any website except all this info? Uh, well, there are many websites, but if you go, a uh, number of you would be on a, uh, Facebook or Twitter. Uh, my Facebook, if you go to Facebook, Nilesh Nilkanta Oak or Nilesh Oak, if you type, you should find my site. And right in my uh, profile, there is a link uh, where uh, you can find my link to my blog, link to my social handles, link to, I have made a list of like 40 specific research accomplishments of mine made over last 10 plus years. 
uh, books and blogs and videos and everything. Uh, and there are many other sites like, you know, also I would encourage if there are parents here and even the, the those uh, students right now, when you get a time, at least one book, I mean, there are many books, CK Raju's book I mentioned, my books, uh, if you find them too technical, don't worry, just ride through the book, you know, the multiple readings are required. But also Raju Malhotra's book, Being Different, okay, it's not always an easy reading, there is no mathematics in it. But every family, especially parents, must consider Raju Malhotra's being different, okay, as like a must read and something that you may read with your family. And it may take time. It's not something to be finished, you know. It is to be read and read it. Read it. Uh, there is a website, okay, that was so interesting. Let's see. Uh, can you recommend a couple of books for all the knowledge he talked? Okay, so my books, I said, then Raju Malhotra's being different, Professor C.K. Raju's uh, is science Western in origin. Also, he's another book. It's available on Amazon and not that costly. Uh, I mean, none of these books are costly. Uh, is uh, uh, Euclid and Jesus. Definitely, I'll encourage you to read that book, Euclid and Jesus, okay, by Professor C.K. Raju. Uh, all right. Let's see. Uh, that's right. I don't see. Oh, what? Oh, uh, okay. One more question, uh, Kavita Ji, there. Uh, what caused the elephant's ancestors to have four tusks? Okay, that's it. that is asked by Yashnil uh, Gajala. Yashnil, it's not what caused them because we are going backwards in time. Uh, they, you might have heard these uh, creatures called, uh, um, please somebody help me here, Avi or somebody help me. Like if you go beyond 11,000 uh, BC, uh, during 11,000 BC and afterwards, during something known as a younger Dryas, significant uh, flora and fauna species were wiped out from the surface of the earth during the younger Dryas when it was an extremely cold spell for 1500 years. Okay, this is after Ramayana times, before Mahabharata times. Okay, and there are evidence related to that in our ancient uh, astronomy text, but that's not the subject today. Again, I have spoken about this in my videos. But to answer your question, so they, um, uh, what are they called? Just help me, someone knows, you know, these are big elephant like uh, hairy creatures. You would have I seen think, uh, the, those are mammoth. 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 Thank you. Yes. Thank you. The, the Ice Age movies, right? Ice Age part yeah, one. Ice Age. Yeah, yeah. So nice. these creatures, they existed around the world, different, known by different names. And yes, they had four tusks. Now, some uh, actually, some of the, I mean, out of the four, few, a few tusks fell down as they grew, grew up. But at certain age, certain uh, lifestyle, certain lifespan of theirs, they 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 carried four tusks and even a three tusk uh, and so on and so forth. So that's the answer. So uh, I know there will be more questions, but because of time, we have to stop. Um, my pleasure. Thank you very much uh, for being there. I know it's not always easy to listen to a monologue, uh, but that's the nature of uh, you know with the online things we have. So thank you again. Unless there is a question, um, we can stop here. Thank you, Nilesh ji. Thank you, everyone. It was uh, wonderful and very nice uh, to have you here. And uh, I will, we, we have an hour and uh, almost uh, 40 minutes break for the lunch. And uh, the next session is uh, concept of karma and law, uh, law of karma. So I want to ensure each of you, all our uh, eminent scholars and speakers are equally intelligent and brilliant. And you will see they, have, they, are, they all are from the very professional background, very <laughs> huge contribution to this ancient uh, heritage, um, knowledge and everything. So you will really be very enriched and uh, will feel very wonderful to list, listen to them and to keep in contact with them. So I thank all of them, especially Nilesh ji for this session. And we would like to invite him on other occasions uh, as well. So thank you Nilesh ji for now. We will you. see you soon. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. And I have written an email address. Those of you who asked there, it's also easy to remember Dr. No from James Bond. Okay, drno.5561bce at gmail.com. So you won't forget the timing of Mahabharata. Okay, <laughs> and N-O are my initials, Nilesh Oak. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ji.
So okay. we will see you also. Yeah. We all have to start again the Gurukul system in which the Nilesh like gentlemen must educate all of us so that so that we can we can all have the rich ancient knowledge which is lacking and all should be included in the curriculum and in the class 9th, 10th, 11th and 12th so that the coming young, young generation may have the May, may have this rich knowledge. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nidhi And Jee. namaskar to all of you from Bharat. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. For this is commendable. This is commendable. I really love the session. Thank you yeah. very, very much. Amazing knowledge. So much to be proud of being in Indian. So Thank grateful you. to the organizers. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, extremely. Thank you very, very much for giving such an in-depth knowledge and uh, doing it for all of us. I, yes, I, we are I, actually we are trying our best uh, to invite uh, all the wonderful people around and inviting students to get in touch with them, have a direct conversation. But uh, 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 we we have a limit at least <laughs> after all. So, so we can we can from we can ask people from you India can, to you, can, you all them. can promote to your yeah. network. Yeah, Isn't we've, I'm, I'm continuously doing that. Yeah, Thank you very because, much. Because uh, we are, we will be uh, doing this until 30th of July. So five days a week, four sessions each day. So all are welcome. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jay. Thank you very much. Vibhaji, thank you so much. We end now.